Every time we send a group out to serve uh, the Lord in one of our short-term trips, we, we have an orientation time where we talk to them about the country they're going into so they know how to uh, act and speak and things to do and not to do, what foods to eat and what foods not to eat, that kind of thing. And really that's what Peter is doing to a group of exiles. There are Christians who are suffering just because they've accepted Jesus as Savior, and they've been taken from their homes, their families, whatever fortunes they had, they're gone. And so they're living in these five provinces along a Roman road, and Peter is writing to them with apostolic authority, trying to tell them how to cope in this new life they have as exiles. And I've mentioned here that in one sense, we're, we're in a couple senses, we're exiles. First of all, because when we came to know Jesus, our citizenship changed. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossian believers in chapter 3. He says, but now your citizenship is in heaven. And the writer of Hebrews explains it as well. He says, but we, like Abraham, are looking for a city, a, a country, whose builder and maker is God. And so this world, as much as we enjoy it, is not home. It wasn't meant to be home, that we have an eternal homecoming. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, we're not some of those that are so heavenly minded, we're not any earthly good. And yet we don't want to be so tied to this world that's not home. This world and all that's in it is already in the, pa uh, uh, the, the, the it's already passing away. And so our, our, uh, our home is somewhere else. We have seen in our country perhaps a little bit more of being in exile. Uh, where there's, there's at least a mild form of persecution of Christianity. Christians were once at the center of culture, and Christian thought and biblical teaching affected so much of culture. Now we've seen Christianity pushed to the margins of culture, in fact, uh, made fun of, uh, ridiculed, and in some, in some quarters actually hated. And so we are exiles to some degree, which, which causes us to pause and say, uh, Peter, show us how to live. How do we respond to this in our time? How do we make a difference? And probably if we sat down and we said, okay, what is our strategy uh, in this new era of post-Judeo-Christian world? What do we do? And if we would list three or four things, I wonder if it'd be the same three that um, Peter mentioned. Would you join me in your Bibles in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, page 1014, if you're using your Bible or your devices, you've, you've probably already been there and read halfway through the book. I want to say that uh, <clears throat> when a person comes to know Jesus as Savior, that moment of time of salvation does so much. It changes our destiny. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. But something happens that our life begins to change dramatically. Um, but this moment of salvation is a moment of grace. We receive it. We receive salvation. We receive the work of Jesus dying on the cross for us. And that begins a, a journey that's grace plus our own effort and determination. The challenge now, according to Paul, he says, for, for whom he did foreknow, <clears throat> he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So the journey began at salvation to become more like Jesus. Now here's the deal. Some people think that that journey to become more like Jesus is just by grace alone, that, that either gradually or all of a sudden, through no effort of our own, we're going to be Christ-like. Um, it doesn't happen that way, folks. Other people think this is all through human effort, and all I have to do is, is do more and work harder. And it doesn't work like that either. Uh, the church I grew up in when I was a kid, the, the road to be more like Jesus was established by, by rules. And you live by the rules, and you would be holy. And it didn't take very long to figure out that that doesn't work, because outward conformity doesn't bring inward change. And so the rules, uh, the legalism, uh, doesn't work towards Christ-likeness. It, the change has to be as God uses His Holy Spirit working in our hearts, using the Word of God from the inside out, okay? So it's a divine human 
cooperative. It's by grace, and yet it involves the Word of God. It involves people. It involves discipline, the disciplines, and it involves right decision-making. And how many of us have been on this journey to be more like Jesus and have just made mistakes? Anybody? Like daily? So we make mistakes, and then we... we uh, beat ourselves up and we, we even in our prayers for forgiveness we say God I did it again I've dishonored you I confessed this sin yesterday and last week and I did it again and we beat ourselves up in this journey may I suggest folks don't beat yourself up don't take it lightly but don't beat yourself up receive the forgiveness of God learn the lessons uh, work on discipline to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. But this is the Christian experience. Salvation demands a transformed life. Can I say something I've said many, many times for years? Just think about it. And that's this, a faith that doesn't change a man's life doesn't save a man's soul. A faith that doesn't change a man's life doesn't change a man's soul. It doesn't, doesn't save a man's soul. I was talking to one of our guys. He's in our neighborhood group. You may be here this morning. He grew up in a very wealthy family in China. And when he came time in his age to go to university, his parents sent him to uh, Germany. And when he was in Germany, he saw uh, what he looked like as a vendor on the street with a table with Christian literature on it. And John looked at the guy and he thought, this guy is a loser. I need, to, I need to buy him lunch so I can help him so that he can get a life. And so he did that. He, he offered to buy the, the man lunch, the man accepted, and the man just led him to Christ. <laughs> and John said, I, I learned about Jesus and what he did for me, and I, I prayed to ask God to forgive my sin, and I accepted Christ into my life. And he said, I, to tell you the truth, I didn't think a whole lot of it until my life started to change. And he said, there's something to this. And now John's a very, very active part of our church and fleshing out his Christian experience, growing to be more like Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's what Paul meant when he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't say work for your salvation, but work it out. In other words, literally it means carry your salvation to its ultimate conclusion, to be more like Jesus. Now let me give you the three things. Uh, that, that Peter talks about here when he's trying to make the point that salvation demands a transformed life. The first thing he says, he says, be <clears throat> or have your mind prepared for action. Notice verse number uh, 13 of chapter 1. He says, <coughs> excuse me, therefore, <clears throat> preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's saying to people who are suffering, he said, set your minds to action. What does he mean by that? I think it means, obviously, from reading Philippians, it means think on the things that we're supposed to be thinking about. The things which are righteous and pure and holy. And everything that's sinful, we need to block out of our minds. Anything that's a, a fantasy of temptations or lust, we put it away. I think what it also means is that we remove from our minds everything that's superfluous to growing to be more like Jesus. So prepare your minds for action. The word literally means, um, it, 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 in fact, it's translated this, I think, in the King James. It says, gird up your minds. Or, in other words, it's, it's a, a picture from the ancient world where they wore the, wore the long garments, and before they would run or before they would work, they would reach down, grab the hems of their garments, and tuck them into their belt so that they would be prepared for action. He's saying, prepare your minds. Prepare your minds for action. I think what it also means here, it says sober-minded. It, be, um, it doesn't mean we're sober-faced, but it does mean that we're locked in on the world in which we live, and we're locked in on our mission. And so we're sober-minded, we're serious about what God has called us to do. I think when I think of these, these preparing your mind for action, I think of a quarterback. This is football season, right? 
How many of you ladies like football? Oh, great, great. Um, my wife's here this morning. She doesn't like football. I would, when I, I played at college, but at the level I played at and the time I played, there was no instant replay. And so Carolyn would come to the games we were dating, and they would, the announcer would say, Taco was made by 44 Schmidt. And she'd stop her cross-stitching. <laughs> and it was too late. I mean, no instant replay. She went right back to cross-stitching. But I think of a quarterback on the sideline, his defense is on the field hoping to stop the opposing team. Hoping to stop him in the three downs and they get the punt. But this quarterback is anticipating. If he's good, he's not joking around and, and throwing water bottles back and forth to the running back. His, he's preparing his mind for when he's going to be on the field. And so he may be looking at uh, pictures that have been taken uh, from the booth up top of the last series. Uh, trying to learn uh, the defense better, what mistakes were made. He may be talking to a running back, he may be talking to a coach. He, he, if, he have his, if he has his helmet off, it's in his hand. He's preparing his mind for action. So when there's a fumble on the field, and he's got to get on the field like that, there's no warning. He's not looking around for his helmet. He's out there, ready to call the play. Folks, we're not on the sideline waiting for action. We are on the field. Every one of us is on the field, and you know that. Uh, later today, we're gathered together for a huddle this morning, just a big huddle, where we're worshiping God and trying to find instructions from God's Word how to, to live this game well. And so we're going to break here in a little while, and you're going to get out of the game again. And there will be the challenges, and you've got to be ready. And what he says, prepare your mind for action. I love what he says here as well. He closes off verse 13, and he says... <clears throat> and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow, do we ever need this on the battlefield when persecution may be heating up? But it's so easy to, to get focused on today and the events of today uh, that we can, either, we can easily get discouraged and downhearted. And that's not what, what's intended here. He says, and set your hope not on deliverance, but on the day. The day when Jesus Christ will be revealed. The beauty of this is it tells us, not only here, but in a dozen other passages of Scripture, that we win. That Jesus Christ is victorious. That was determined on the cross. But he's victorious and he'll come again. And the Bible says he'll come with a horse and with a mighty host. And he'll speak and the armies of the world will be destroyed in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. And so it, what he's saying to these exiles who are going through suffering and set your hope not on legislation changing and not on uh, uh, um, electing new officials and not on a law being enacted. Um, don't you set your hope in that. Set your hope in the grace of God when Jesus Christ will be revealed and may that day give us hope for this day. So the first thing he says is prepare your minds for action. The second thing he says is be holy. Notice verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each, man's, each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were transformed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like, a lamb, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. For he, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. What he's saying to these exiles who are suffering a whole lot more than we are, he said, you need to be holy. The word holy means pure. But the essence of the word goes beyond purity. It means separate. And so when the angels in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4 and 5, when they say, holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts who was and is and is to come. What he's talking about is that God is separate. That there is a category called God and there's one in it. And that's the Lord Almighty. And the distance between God and fallen man is, is gigantic, obviously. He's holy and we're not. And so it, what, what Peter is saying is at the time of salvation, you, you, you went into a different family. He calls them children. And he says to the children, you have a father, and your father is holy. Just as your father is holy, now you be holy. Okay? And that's the challenge for every one of us. Not to beat ourselves up. Not to excuse it. Because did you, did you notice what he says here in be verse 17? He closes with, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. I don't know how you handle that word fear. Are we supposed to live in fear? In fact, the scripture says, we looked at it before, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love, discipline, and a sound mind. What does it mean to conduct yourselves in fear throughout the days of your exile. The scripture also tells us in Romans chapter eight and verse one, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there's no longer any condemnation. And so what he's talking about in John is that one day we're gonna stand before the throne of God and give an account. First John chapter four, first John chapter three, it talks about that, that we're gonna stand before Jesus and give an account. Are you afraid of that day? Uh, don't be, because there will no longer be any condemnation. When I was a kid, uh, the church I grew up in, it just seemed like every year we would have revival meetings, and one night of those revival meetings, a speaker would just scare the socks off us kids. He would say, now you're going to stand before the Lord. You'll have your turn. There'll be a long line. So lots of people will be there watching. You'll be standing in line, um, and there'll be a big screen, and it'll be the story of your life and all the mistakes and all the sins that you committed for everybody to see. And I thought, wow. Even as a kid, I thought, that's going to be a long movie <laughs> and not a good one. It's not going to be like that, folks. There's no longer going to be any condemnation. However, we must not take this life lightly. We must take sin seriously. And we must say no. And every one of us has stuff in our lives, don't we? Your list may be different than mine. Your weaknesses may be different than mine. But every one of us has, has weaknesses in our life and propensities for different things. It may be uh, substance abuse. It may be thought life. It may be pornography. Maybe some have gone outside the bounds of marriage and, and you're, you're here this morning and you feel horrible. Um, receive the forgiveness of God. Find His grace. He'll give you His grace. And there's no sin that we can commit that God can't forgive. There's no sin that, that, um, that his blood doesn't cover. So wherever you are this morning, whatever sin you've committed, it's so important you turn from that and come back to God. Okay? We have to live with a sense of fear. But that fear is not a dreadful fear. It's, 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 a, it's an awe and a, a deep respect and it's reverence. Live in deep reverence for God. Can I say it this way? For those who are following Jesus Christ, fear means awe and respect. For those who are not following Jesus Christ, fear means fear. Okay? That's what it means. In fact, the New Testament writer says uh, that we, uh, we serve a God who is a consuming fire. And so I think too many believers have adopted this view of God as kind of a cuddly buddy. And while he's our friend, he'll also be our judge. And the judgment seat of Christ will be for the receiving and the loss of rewards 
um, there will not be any condemnation. But what he's saying here in this passage, he's saying we can live with confidence and be holy. Why? He says here, why? Because Jesus died for us. He shed his blood to deliver us from this life. So why in the world after this, when we have a new life, would we go back to the old life when we recognize that we have been redeemed from that? And the word redeemed here, uh, uh, he follows it up with the word ransom. The ransom for our redemption was high. I've told some of you have been around for years. I have like a second cousin in Germany who uh, his family made a lot of money. Um, he sold his portion of it for 300 million back in the early 80s. In 1997, he was kidnapped and held for ransom. He's since written, written a book about it called In the Cellar. He was held for 30 days. The ransom was $20 million, and the family paid it. And he was released. They never have found the kidnappers. What would your ransom be, by the way? Like, what are you worth? What am I worth? You say, I got a 12 foot boat. I've got a couple old cars. Maybe you have a baseball card collection. What are you worth? And aren't you glad he says here, your, the ransom could not be paid with silver or gold? Because if it could, most of us wouldn't make it. But the ransom was paid. And the, the, the price of the ransom determines your worth. God says, I love you so much, I'm going to buy you out of bondage. And the price for the, the ransom for that is the blood and the death of my son. Folks, that makes every one of you of extreme eternal value in the eyes of God. When he's done all of this to deliver us from sin, he says, then why would you go back to a life that I've redeemed you from? Live for him. The third one, let me give it to you quickly. And that is that we have to love one another. Isn't it interesting? To a bunch of exiles who are, being, who are suffering, he gives them these three things. Prepare your mind for action. <clears throat> Looking forward to the day. Be holy. And then love one another. Notice, as I read verses 22 and following, having purified your souls by your obedience to, to the truth for a sincere and brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. He commands them to do it, but he commands them to do it earnestly with a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the Word of God remains forever. Folks, why? Why do we love one another? He gives two reasons. First of all, because we've been obedient to live holy lives. And secondly, verse 23, because we've been born again. And the basis for all of that is the Word of God that lives forever. Our society has broadened the parameters of that which is acceptable. And the Apostle Peter says, uh, no, our society has done that, but has done it through the minds of men. And men fade away like grass, but what doesn't fade away is this book, Love One Another.